Welcome to Mythic Muscle, the podcast where we delve into the fascinating worlds of fitness and folklore. I'm your host, Benjamin Cloud, and in each episode, we'll explore the myths, legends, and stories from cultures around the world and see how they intersect with the world of fitness. What I aim to do is provide a captivating, dramatic retelling and set you on your way to a healthier version of yourself. As a power lifter and a bodybuilder with a deep interest in mythology and folklore, I've always been intrigued by the ways that ancient cultures viewed strength, power, and the human body. In each episode, I'll take you on a journey through a different mythological tale or figure, exploring its literary nature and its relevance to modern fitness culture. And to really bring the story to life, I'll also present a specialized workout program that's inspired by the mythological themes we discuss. So whether you're a fitness enthusiast looking for some new workout ideas, a mythology buff, curious about the deeper meanings behind these tales, or just someone who loves a good story, this podcast is for you. Join me on this journey of discovery, and let's explore the intersection of fitness and folklore together. Tyr, the one-handed god, the embodiment of law, son of Odin. Tyr's myth begins in a nearly whimsical place, as do most myths within Norse mythology. Like many gods of the Great North, Tyr was a bit of a drunkard. Tyr and his brother Thor stride the ice-capped mountains of Jotunheim, home of the giants. The slick snow beneath their heels would stumble most mortals, but for these two brother gods, they merely grind the sleet below them into a fine, powdery dust. Looking out across the icy plains into the dark forests dotted amid the frozen taiga, Thor and Tyr watch the sun fade. Winter's frigid grip unrelenting. Not long now, the two brothers continue their trek in silence. It wouldn't do them much good to speak as the howling gales of hail and driving snow would muffle their voices completely from each other. Even the booming roar of the Thunder God is no match for Jotunheim's brutal blizzards. This world of giants is grim and inhospitable. The pair of men pine for their long tables, cold ale, sweet mead, and warm halls of Asgard. The thought of returning home keeps their bodies warm and their heads set. Egir, the sea engulfer, is originally from this place of Jotunheim, he himself being a giant. As he aged, he became deified and holds reign over the domain of the sea. As a form of thanks to the rest of the Aesir, the sea giant holds great feasts within his hall. Gods may eat a lot, but they certainly drink much, much more. In full knowledge of the thirst of the gods, Aegir tasks Tyr and Thor to find Hymir's kettle, a cauldron which through magic would brew an infinite amount of beer. Of course, Thor and Tyr, two men completely incapable of passing on a challenge, accept and ride the Bifrost to Utgard, or Jotunheim, where they might find Hymir's home and his endless cauldron. The two, expecting a fight, stood at the threshold of Hymir's house with hammer and blade in hand. Answering their presence was Tyr's grandmother, who immediately states that they're lucky she answered the door and that Hymir was away. She ushers them in and advises them to hide amongst Hymir's kettles, as any moment now Hymir will be returning home. As they had hidden within one of Hymir's massive kettles, the light and warmth in the room dies as he slams the door ajar. The bone-chilling winter air hunts the fire and stamps it out. Hymir sniffs, the scent of Aesir blood thick on the wind. He thunders around the house, looking for whatever's been brought to his abode. Just as it appears the pair might escape with their lives and a cauldron, Ymir thrusts a hand through one of the pillars that held the roof aloft, sending parts of the ceiling down upon the two. Thor brandishes Mjolnir. Lightning cascades from the head of the hammer, illuminating the room once more. And in the new light, Hymir recoils in fear at the sight of the two Aesir, instead apologizing for his actions of defending his home. He produces a feast for the two men, presenting three full oxen which Thor promptly devours, saving one for bait for an upcoming hunt. They leave with one of Hymir's legendary kettles and set off for their feast. This first story is found within the Himiskvita, and is the first of which mentions Tyr, yet it is by no means his most famous. That would be the story found within the Gilfraining. Fenrir, the harbinger of the end, is much too dangerous an entity to let roam freely. The Aesir keep the beast bound in chains, fettered by cold steel instead of godly magic. It is foretold that the Fenrisvulfur will bring about the death of Odin, god of gods, and bring about Ragnarok, ending life as it is known. A beast capable of killing Odin is one of great stature, 
Slaughtering it would be difficult, and also, it would be a shame to see such a being of immense power slain. The barren plains of ice which house Fenrir's dwelling swirl with a dangerous, chaotic storm. Snow, lightning, and thunder pelt the area perpetually, serving as a protective barrier against those who would seek to chain the Great Wolf. But Thor, master of thunder and great speaker of the elements, would forge a clearing for his Aesir companions. They would crack the ice with each footstep. Thunder would boom as Thor's collar rose. Fenrir would come to meet them, knowing what he must do to retain his peace. Thor, Tyr, and the rest of the Aesir challenged Fenrir to a game, just as they always had. They would hunt him, chain him, and Fenrir would break the chains and escape, building a den elsewhere until they find him once again. This time would be different. Fenrir looked upon the chains they brought. They looked different, lithe, wrought of some thin metal that appeared far too brittle to resist his monumental strength. He is right to be skeptical. These chains are unlike any other. They are Hleipnir, the open one, forged by the dwarves of Svartalfheim, also called Nithavellir. These dwarves are master craftsmen, and their skill is unmatched by even those of the Aesir themselves. They forged Mjolnir and crafted Gungnir, Odin's spear. Fenrir recognized the craftsmanship, as he'd been stabbed by Odin's spear or bashed by Thor's hammer many a time. He denied the game, stating that these chains are abnormal and he would not be able to break them. The Aesir pleaded with Fenrir, but there was only one condition in which he would accept. Tyr must place his hand inside Fenrir's mouth. If anything dubious occurs, Fenrir will rip it off. Tyr, without hesitation or second thought, understanding the stakes of having Fenrir unfettered, places his hand directly into Fenrir's fiery maw. Kleipnir was placed along the great shoulders of the wolf, and to Fenrir's dismay, he was completely incapable of moving them. He quickly realized that this was no game. They had truly sought to enslave him this time. He wrenched Tyr's hand from its rightful place and began to flee. Tyr, stoically without remark, began to wrestle Fenrir, but it was of no use and the beast fled deeper into the ice-covered tundra. Ragnarok would not be stayed. Tyr understood, too, what his place was within Ragnarok, that he would battle with the great wolf Garmir, and the two of them would fall in combat. And when the day came, Tyr sliced through the hordes of Ragnarok, knowing his duty. He sought out Garmir and dueled him in single combat. If not for this duel, Odin would fall too soon and his son Vidar, prophesied to kill Fenrir, would not arrive in time to avenge his father's death, halting Ragnarok in its tracks. It is unclear whether or not Garmir is Fenrir, but the evidence points to it being rather likely. Tyr's legacy is one of war and justice. He slays Garmir or Fenrir, who stole his hand and ensures that the world continues to spin. Nordic Vikings carved runes for Tyr within their blades, for luck and to pay their respect for the fallen god. Their admiration of him didn't end there, as they would set aside one day per week to honor the great warrior god. This, it is said, is where we get the word Tuesday from. Tyr is one of my personal favorite gods, though I feel he's often underrepresented. Many know Thor, Loki, or Odin, but only one of those gods has a day named after him. It's a shame more people don't know of the other god we have a day for. Tyr appears in a few video games, namely Smite and God of War Ragnarok, which both have wildly different spins on the character. I think somewhere between the two we might find a pretty good representation. There are multiple sources depicting Tyr with a spear, scepter, or sword, with the sword being the only named weapon he wielded, to my knowledge. It is called Tyrfing, and has its own series of legends surrounding it called the Tyrfing Cycle. Otherwise, Tyr's physical descriptors are slim. The important bits are the sword and the lack of hand. Other than that, it's up to your read of him. Now for some fitness, while I still have both of my hands. I grow exceedingly tired of seeing Viking Workout, Honor the Gods with Your Gains style titles on YouTube. It's cheesy, it's boring, and really it doesn't do much other than harbor a specific crowd. I'm gonna evade that entirely for this one. We'll come back to it later when we get around to Thor. This does lock me out of the main thing I like to do for these fitness portions, though, and that's researching the group of people who made the myth, and then adapting it to modern-day sports science. But what it also does is force me to open my mind a little bit, be a little creative with it. So this session is going to be a dumbbell-only training session, as if you were one-handed, and maybe you are, no shame there, you wouldn't be able to properly execute most barbell movements. And Tyr, well, they call him the one-handed god for a reason. 
Exercise number one, incline dumbbell press superset with dumbbell pullovers, four sets, eight reps for both, RPE nine. I can't completely divorce myself from history here. So the one thing I will be drawing on from the Vikings is their description from everyone they raided. A common theme is their height, broad build, and thick torsos. In my research of their burial records, I found this to be mostly accurate. Incline dumbbell press is the hands-down best dumbbell exercise to craft a chest shelf that you could rest a glass of water on. I've got no idea why you'd want to do that, but if you're a gym rat, tell me that doesn't sound appetizing. I used to do these with a lot of weight, and pretty fine technique, but I've since lowered the weight dramatically and switched my technique up to something with a greater benefit. Instead of lowering the dumbbells to just near my armpits, I lower them to just outside the width of my shoulders. This sounds crazy, but if you use a light weight, you can get the most ridiculous stretch on your pecs. And if you've seen the Just the Fit episode on stretch-mediated hypertrophy, you know what that means. Huge gains. Dumbbell pullovers were done by old-school bodybuilders to, quote, expand the rib cage. That's kind of bullshit. Outside of grievously injuring yourself, nothing you do in the gym will change your bone structure. But what pullovers will do is increase your flexibility, strengthen your serratus, and burn your lats in a way that you really can't reproduce with any other exercise. In turn, this will make your torso appear thicker, more dense, and really, it's a great exercise if a little misrepresented in current fitness circles. Exercise number two, dumbbell tricep extensions. Four sets, 12 to 15 reps, RPE8. These are one of my favorite tricep builders. You can perform them standing up, seated, laying down. They're exceptionally versatile, and there's not a huge risk of injury unless you're training far too heavy. They target all three heads of the tricep, they're stretch mediated, hint hint, and they're really really easy to fit into any program. I recommend a huge pause at the bottom of the lift, keep your elbows tight to your ears, and don't focus as much on the contraction at the top. It sounds crazy, but the contraction at the top isn't doing much for your triceps, even if it feels like it is. It's all about that length and stretch, baby. Why am I like this? <clears throat> Exercise number three, the shoulder giant set. I have to explain this one before I give sets and reps. I couldn't not add a giant set into a fitness routine inspired by a myth that heavily features giants. That's ludicrous. So the shoulder giant set is going to be a giant set hitting all three heads of the shoulder with no rest between exercises, just between sets. Your first exercise is going to target the side delts, the classic side lateral raise, dumbbell lateral raise if the first one's too redundant for you. Explode from the bottom position to the top and slowly lower the weight to your hip. Focus on the essential as that's where you're going to build most of the muscle using the lateral raise. The next exercise in the giant set is going to hit the rear delts, probably the most neglected portion of the shoulder, but the one that'll give you that comic book thick 3D appearance. The bench rear delt fly looks a lot like the side lateral raise, but the slightest tweak in technique biases the rear delts instead of the side delts. Put your chest flat against the bench set at a 30 to 45 degree angle. Let your arms hang in a straight line and then raise the dumbbell to shoulder level with your arms straight. It's very similar to the side lateral raise, but the difference the bench makes is astronomical. If you don't believe me, give it a shot. And the third exercise of the giant set is going to be for the most commonly overdeveloped portion of the shoulder, the front delt. As a note, the later you put an exercise in a workout, the less effective it will be for the muscle. That's just how fatigue works. Standing dumbbell press will give you a ton of shoulder strength, but requires a hugely strong core and challenges shoulder mobility. Both are great things for the realm of strength training. Most people already bias their front delts in every other pressing movement, so the focus is on the first two exercises primarily, with the standing dumbbell press rounding out the giant set neatly. The first two sets take all three exercises to within three reps of failure. Then for the last two sets, go all the way to failure on all three exercises. Exercise number four, forearm curls. Four sets, 20 to 30 reps. It's purely tongue in cheek. That's the only reason this is here. Forearm curls are intensely effective for building strong pronation, which is useful in like literally every single possible exercise you can do, and transfers to a lot of everyday things like opening the door, carrying groceries, or shaking people's hands vigorously. Plus, it'll make you better at arm wrestling, which I'm sure if you're an Aesir, you've probably drunkenly arm wrestled a countless number of people. In truth, most people are lacking grip. It's something you won't realize unless you directly train it, but having a strong grip really benefits every aspect of your training. You are able to hit your arms better, your back better, your chest better, all because your forearms won't be the limiting factor. The actual muscle group you're attempting to target will. And if you're like me and don't like using straps, it's not an ego thing, I'm just too stupid to set them up properly and then they're uneven and then I get frustrated and it's a whole bunch of, you'll be able to double overhand deadlift without any issues. And that shit looks mad impressive if you understand what you're looking at. If you're also really focused on hypertrophy, having big forearms will absolutely make your physique stand out. It's one of those silhouette muscle groups. This session is designed around building that broad, wide, brutish aesthetic, which I think is a goal for a lot of people. But in truth, that's primarily dictated by genetics and diet. You can only broaden 
broaden your frame so much via exercises, don't stress too much about it. Just keep going and one day you'll wake up and your shirt won't fit exactly right. At first you'll be confused and then you'll smile at your sexy ass broad shoulders. Tyr's myth is short. He's not mentioned a ton in the sagas, which is unfortunate, but he inspired the Vikings so much that their blades bore his name. And the Romans thought he was such a badass they named a day after him. While I can't guarantee that this session will deify you, I can say that it'll definitely get you closer to that level of badass. Probably. With that, I have been your host, Benjamin Cloud. This has been the Mythic Muscle Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Have a lovely day, a skin-splitting lift. Or, if it's a rest day, go research how the hell you pronounce these names. I had to find an Icelandic pronunciation guide, like an actual book. Wild. Take care, folks. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. For only $3 a month, you get Discord access, and you buy me a protein bar. $5 a month, that's your Discord access with special colors and emotes, blooper reels, shout out for me, and transcripts of each episode. $10 a month gets you all of that noise, a vote in our monthly poll, a personalized 10 second clip of whatever you want me to say, and every dollar spent at that tier goes right back into the podcast so that I might bring you a better listening experience. Follow my socials. You can find me on pretty much every platform by searching for Mythic Muscle Podcast and looking for the helmet crossed with the barbell and the microphone. If you made it this far, you're my favorite type of human. I hope you have a wonderful day, a fantastic lift, or if it's a rest day, you get some quality relaxation time. Thank you.